I'm Andrew Pollard. Um, you know, I recognize that this is an investor conference, so I can't think of a better way um, to end the event than with a panel stacked like this. Um, on stage between the four of us, uh, in 2016, we were responsible for, well, three of us were responsible for um, the, some of the most talked about acquisitions, uh, and one of us is known for never having missing uh, an episode of Judge Judy. So it's a very highly accoladed uh, group of people here. Um, now, the, though they all look very different, the, the, if you look at their CVs, their backgrounds are strikingly similar. Um, all of them hit a big very, very early on in their careers. Um, but most importantly, they followed it up um, with a string of successes in an industry uh, where the odds are stacked against you. So all three of these people um, uh, have figured out the secret sauce. And between them, there's billions upon billions of shareholder value creation. So, you know, this is something that you're not going to see locally uh, very often. So thank you all for coming here today. Um, starting on my right, um, probably with the best nickname you'll ever find in junior mining, the Queen of Diamonds, who uh, is credited in her 20s of uh, making a discovery, which ended up uh, turning into the second largest diamond mine in Canada. She kicked off uh, the Yukon Gold Rush last year with her takeout of Kamenak Gold by Gold Corp for half a billion dollars. Uh, and her spare time, um, she formed a company that uh, is, is best known for pulling out softball-sized uh, diamonds, and, and they, they account for 50% of the global uh, diamond production of massive carrots. So, Ira Thomas. Um, second up. Uh, we, we've got no slouch himself. Uh, he's never made second place look so good in a competition. He was runner-up to, to the Gold Corp Challenge. Uh, decided to, to follow it up um, with, uh, I, I guess, about $3 billion of shareholder value creation between 2000 and 2013 when uh, his company, Frontier Gold, was acquired for $2.3 billion plus a few spin-outs, which added to the kitty, but um, he's, uh, last year he, he was chairman of True Gold Mining, uh, which was sold for $240 million to Endeavor, uh, Marco Day. And last, but certainly not least, uh, we pulled out of retirement. He started it in his 20s with a, with a uh, I guess, a wild ride and, and a, a gambling sort of personality. Um, went back to the same project he struck his riches on uh, in his 20s as a geologist, uh, culminating in a sale of terrain metals for $650 million. Um, and then he decided to finally be the face of his own deal. Uh, and in three years, he took new market gold from an, ID, uh, from an idea to $1 billion takeout by Kirkland Lake. So we got Doug Forster. So, yeah, first off, this is, you, you know, it, it, as an investor conference goes, these three know what they're doing. Um, if I could uh, maybe just start with Ira and then we'll work down. You know, what's your, you know, you were three of the most talked about acquisitions of 2016. You know, what do you see happening in the industry right now? I mean, it, it seems that there's been a lot of, um, uh, there's a shortage of projects and there seems to be people kicking the tires, but there's not the fervor of activity. Do, do you see it picking up uh, more? Yeah, listen, I think we've been through a really difficult, you know, three to five years in this in this business. And and I think for those companies and, and those individuals that have been through cycles before and understand the value of perseverance, I think what we started to see in 2016 was uh, some of that perseverance paying off with some of the senior cap companies starting to look around for, for assets, particularly in the gold space. So that's what created an opportunity for us at, at Kamenak. And, you know, we were hopeful uh, that, you know, it was a sign of things to come. The market hasn't completely uh, taken off to the, to the degree where I would say we're all really satisfied, but I, I do think what we're seeing now, and as my other panelists can attest to, is that, you know, quality projects with quality people that are, that are really working to advance their projects and de-risk them uh, are coming on the radar uh, of larger companies, and, and there are opportunities in the space to, uh, to continue to sell these assets and, and uh, look for other acquisitions. And Mark, what about you? Do you, do you see uh, activity and, and maybe valuations on a per ounce basis going up as people try and beat each other out? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if the valuation per ounce is going to go up. I mean, I'll just kind of circle back to the, um, kind of the original theme, and that is 
as, as recently as 2015, um, we were still in the doldrums and early 2016, we were still, companies were still in sort of the fetal position and uh, they were focused on shoring up their balance sheets, paying off debt, uh, selling assets to do it and certainly the M&A cycle had not begun. Mm -hmm. I think the, um, like the true goal deal to Endeavor in, in March of 2016 was a, a kind of ground zero. It, it, it kicked off, I think, a lot of other deals and it became okay again for intermediates and major mining companies to get back into the acquisition mode. So, um, you know, the Kamenak deal uh, and the new market deal obviously came close on the heels of True Gold and it, and it has continued to today mm -hmm. with, uh, with Exeter and Gold Rock and uh, Integra, Plowed, I'm probably missing a few, but you know, there was a handful of really good deals over the last 18 months. And we're also seeing, more importantly, I think, uh, an acceleration of strategic toeholds and investments in, in juniors, mm -hmm. right? Development stage juniors, there's not a lot left. There's probably six or seven or eight, maybe, that are in good jurisdictions with good projects and good returns. And we're seeing, in the last two years, $460 million invested by corporates in those other development projects compared to 160 million in the previous two years. So there's been a massive increase in, in strategic investments. And uh, a lot of these companies have more than one major invested in them, which is creating a lot of tension and uh, excitement. Right. Yeah. And Doug, maybe if I might rejig the question a little to you, uh, you know, a theme um, among conferences like this is the, the term optionality and, and uh, companies pursuing a development of assets or, or marketing assets that may only be economic at 1400 gold or 1500 gold. Do you think that um, with the spate of acquisitions that's happened um, and the lack of projects that are economic at these prices, do you think we're going to see a run on um, uh, acquisitions of projects that may only be economic at a higher level before gold gets there? You know, do we have to wait till $1,500 gold for the acquisitions to happen for a $1,500 project? It's a good, it's a good thought, uh, Andrew. And, and you know, we're in the gold business. If you're in the gold business, you have to believe the price of your commodity is going higher. So, you know, if gold's, uh, you know, when we bought uh, the three gold mines in Australia for a new market, gold was 1100 No one wanted those assets. It was hard to fund those assets at the time, actually, back in 2015. 14 months later, Gold's 1350. We sold that company for a billion dollars, and, and the, those mines are doing very, very well for Kirkland Lake. So you have to have a long-term view. Yes, of course, you don't want to uh, be looking at, at gold assets, for instance, that require $2,000 gold. Uh, you know, that, that's uh, that's a wish list that I'm I'm not I'm not subscribing to necessarily. But you do have to have a long-term vision. This is the business we're in. And uh, I think ultimately right now we're in a good part of the cycle. This is a good time for investors. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we've seen not a complete buy-in yet from institutional investors in the gold sector, uh, for instance. But I think that's going to come. I think we'll see elevated prices ahead. Um, stick with good management teams, and I think most investors uh, can do quite well um, in any market. Uh, but this is going to be a rising market in my view. So when you started the company in 2013, obviously the writing was on the wall for the industry and I mean, it was dark times. What made you feel confident in actually paying you know, money and, and, and to buy this production when you, know, you, you were, I guess, trying to catch the proverbial knife at the right time and you could have gotten cut? Yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting. Uh, typically, I would say uh, when we acquire, uh, we're looking to uh, start a new deal. We acquire the asset first and then great assets attract great management teams. In the case of Newmarket, we actually had the management team, we had the board, we had Lucas Lundin, we had Randall Oliphant, we had Ray Threll called, Doug Hurst, Blaine Johnson, and others. So we did it a little bit, a little different that way, and that gave us the confidence, that gave us uh, the confidence, the deal flow, right? We had the people, and we knew that those great people would attract great assets. It did take two years, a little longer than I would have liked, but we ended up with uh, quality assets in a tier one jurisdiction, and ultimately the shareholders uh, did very well. Mm -hmm. Do you think, um, uh, I'll, I'll toss this to Ira, because Lucaro is one of the few sort of emerging juniors that uh, uh, does something that would be considered a four-letter word in mining, which is pay a dividend. 
Um, you, you know, obviously you've got a lot of skin in the game and, and so do the other co-founders. Do you think that, uh, is that what sort of made the decision to return profits to you instead of just chasing growth and being the big and, biggest and baddest? Well, the diamond sector is a bit different because growth is, is, is actually pretty difficult. It's a very small space. There's very few economic minds. And so even if you want to pursue growth, it's, it's not something that you can necessarily do within a, a time frame that's really going to pay dividends um, to your shareholders. So for, for us, this, you know, this, the decision was quite simple. Until we found the right asset to acquire, we're generating lots of cash. We've got a really healthy balance sheet. And we felt that this was a, a really great opportunity to actually return cash to our shareholders. And as a result, we were, you know, attracted a much higher rating, I think, than most of our peers in the space. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's just a testament to the way the market has moved. I, I think, you know, a decade ago, growth was what everybody wanted to see. And, 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 you know, shareholders were willing to pay up for those companies that had the most aggressive growth strategy. We've seen uh, a real migration away from that now to uh, shareholders looking for companies that are responsible with their cash and that have strong balance sheets and that are positioned to weather down cycles and that are thinking about um, how to maximize value for the shareholders. So that's been a real change, I think, in the, in the last uh, five years. Do you think um, management having a significant amount of skin in the game uh, y you know, decides whether you're, you're going to do what's probably in the best interest of the shareholders to you know, return a profit versus just, you Absolutely. know. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And I think that's always something to really pay attention to as an investor um, when, you know, you're, especially if you're, if you're, if you're, you know, doing your research and looking at the assets. At the end of the day, a quality management team is great, but how much skin, you know, how big a check have they written and, and are they exposed and are they aligned with your own interests? Were, uh, Doug, were you ever, did, did you pay a dividend at the end, or, or was it something that was ever on the radar for you, or were you always chasing other uh, acquisitions? I've actually never paid a dividend. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm actually kind of proud of that. We put money back in the ground in most of our companies. Um, Kirk and Lake, who purchased New Market, just started paying a dividend. If you look at the correlation, there isn't a direct one-to-one -one correlation between companies that pay the highest dividend and shareholder return in terms of the share price. Yes, it's an it's a, it's a income for shareholders. Yes, it's important. Ultimately, we, we tend to focus on growth and invest in growth. Now, of course, now that um, you know, New Market started as a $40 million company and now Kirkland Lake's a $2.2 billion company, that is the time to start paying a dividend, and they are. But uh, typically, I like to reinvest capital, create value for shareholders in the ground, um, and uh, if they want to get dividends, they can certainly choose from a number of companies that do that. In terms of, uh, I'll, I'll throw this over to, oh. yeah, maybe. I was just going to say that, I, I mean, agreeing with Doug, I mean, that is a fundamental difference between commodities as well. I mean, with diamonds, again, the growth, the growth opportunity is, is much less uh, than it is with a sector like, like gold. So I, I, I agree with, with Doug in that sense. It just depends. Right. Mark, um, when obviously you commissioned True Gold and then saw through to commercial production, was it always your, your goal when you got it the, to, to position it to get taken out or would you have been happy running it as a, a producer yourself and maybe growing the company? So it's always easier with the takeout, for sure. <laughs> right. And uh, you know, you have to be nimble and we were at a very, very dark time in the, in the market, as we all remember. And it became clear sort of halfway through the sort of the financing efforts of True Gold that um, the only way to extract value from this opportunity was going to be to build it and produce an operating mine and, and see what happens then. So I, I, I kind of uh, like an analogy to building a house, right? If you build a house that you want to live in, then you're probably, someone might want to buy it one day. But if you build a house to flip, chances are you're going to be stuck with it, right? Yeah. So we built a house to live in it, and uh, we got approached shortly after uh, pouring gold. So we built an operating mine and financed it in uh, the toughest time in the market that I can remember. And we got approached by Endeavor, and what really sealed the deal for us was not so much the headline number, it was a $240 million headline number, but what sealed the deal for us was 
we got deep into the weeds and what Endeavor's plans were to grow organically. And we were convinced that Endeavor was going, was on the right track, had the right balance sheet fix and the right backing and the right team to turn into a million ounce a year producer. And so since we've done the deal, um, we ended up owning, True Gold ended up owning 20% of Endeavor and Endeavor uh, went from $12 to $27. So it turned out to be a, about a $550 million deal for True Gold shareholders through that re-rating of being part of something much, much bigger, which, which we bought into and believed in at the time that we negotiated that sale. I was going to say 240 million is very small for you, so yes, uh, glad we're able to get it up there. Oh, it's, it's big enough. <laughs> um, so uh, all three of you have had success both as the face of your own deals, but you've also had a lot of success um, forming companies and I guess backing entrepreneurs to be the face of them. What do you look for in a CEO or a management team that you're willing to put your name and, and your money to ultimately? And I'll give it to Doug. Yeah. Um, I think track record, uh, first of all, experience. I mean, that, that may be track record of, of creating value for shareholders or for just making discoveries or for taking projects to feasibility. Whatever your strategy is, uh, you look for that type of track record. I always look for people that I can work with, trust and respect. You know, that's really important to me. Have fun. If you're going you're gonna to have fun, if you're going to work with people you enjoy being with. And ultimately, it was already mentioned, uh, I think, uh, uh, regarding skin in the game, critical. Uh, senior managers, CEO, senior uh, VPs, uh, hopefully uh, will write a check uh, to the best of their abilities. You know, not everyone going to write the same check, but uh, they got to have some exposure, some risk, and that drives them and all of us to uh, succeed, uh, create value for shareholders. Mm -hmm. What about you, Mark? You obviously have Oxygen Capital and you formed countless companies. Uh, wh what do you look for in, in a management team? Well, over the years, over the last 12 or 13 years, we've created um, uh, eight, I think, eight new full first CEOs. So full-time first-ever CEOs have come out of the Oxygen group of companies, which is something that I'm very proud of. So they're not people who had ever been CEOs before, mm. right? And so they, but they had the passion and the drive and the commitment. And I'm just looking for smart people who are hungry. Right? And they can be mentored, you know, you can build support around them to help them grow and, and get up the learning curve. Not everybody comes with a track record. And, you know, oftentimes, frankly, people who've uh, had a couple of big hits get pretty complacent. So I'm looking for smart young people who are hungry and ambitious and, and want to hit a home run. Okay, I'm available. Um, and Ira, what about you? I mean, obviously, Lucara, in, in you know, her spare time, has already reached a billion dollars in sales, so she, she knows a thing or two about that. Well, I, I think that both um, Doug and Mark have touched on, uh, you know, the same points that I would make. I think mentorship is really important. I think it's, it's so critical um, when you're putting together a team to recognize that it's never about one person that you need a complement of skills if you're going to be su successful. So you can, you can find the smartest person, but if they can't work with you know, the broader group of executives in that organization, then it may not be successful. So I think what you see, um, and, and certainly my experience over 25 years of doing this, is that you really have to put the right people around the table. And as Doug said, people that like to work together that respect to work together and actually have a fun doing it. And, and that, quite frankly, isn't as easy as it, as it sounds. And, and I think anyone that's been serially successful in this business understands that you know, putting together that group of people is, is really the key. Right, yeah, that's great. Um, so, uh, you know, we touched on this before a little bit, but the last uh, bull market was sort of marred by companies wanting to be the biggest and the baddest. They wanted to add ounces. Uh, they wanted to increase reserves and they wanted to um, go after projects and, and to ever higher valuations. But, you know, in a declining market, that led to some crazy write downs, too. Do you think that this go around, maybe the lessons have learned and it might be the rise of the single asset company or, or maybe the smaller um, but profitable producers may become the flavor of the day? Uh, Doug, you know about production. Let's start with you. Well, I mean, uh you know, it takes the same amount of management time to run a small gold mine as a large gold mine. 
So I think ultimately, and to have impact on your bottom line, your net asset value, your earnings, uh, cash flow per share, uh, you're, you're hopefully looking at something that's material, something that's uh, larger in terms of acquisitions. Yeah, a lot of lessons were learned in the last, last cycle. Uh, we saw a lot of deleveraging over the last few years of balance sheets because they became extremely debt-ridden uh, through acquisitions. Um, acquisitions were top-line growth as opposed to focusing on bottom-line success. And all of that led to you know, what, what we know now is uh, a lot of write-downs, as you said, Andrew. So I think now the focus really is creative acquisitions, strategic acquisitions uh, that impact uh, earnings, cash flow per share, net asset value. Uh, bringing strategic assets together, like Gold Core's uh, recent pr uh, purchase of uh, Exeter, uh, and then JV with Barrick, that was an interesting deal because it, it brought those two assets together under senior management, uh, senior management leadership. So, I think um, I think every asset's different. You know, when I have my metrics of what I want to look for on an acquisition, uh, there's a whole suite of them. I never get all of them. You know, each asset is different and specific. And so I keep a very broad mind in terms of what I'm looking for, what type of acquisitions, each one's unique. And that's the way we try and run our business. Mm -hmm. Mark, maybe I'll switch the topic completely. And um, uh, obviously you, you made your name at the Gold Corp Challenge and, and Integra did a, a, an event a few years ago, PDAC, which had a million dollar prize. And uh, it was an AI focused um, company that came up and, and was able to delineate the best exploration targets. I'm wondering if you see any transformative technologies about to be unleashed that could change the game in mining and, or exploration or whatever, and if there's something you're backing. I wish I had uh, the secret weapon like that, and I don't. I mean, I'm not seeing anything that is super transformational uh, out there. I mean, I, I did walk around the the uh, the, um, the auditorium during the last challenge, and there was some interesting stuff. Um, and but I kind of saw it all as as more sort of incremental gains as opposed to something completely transformational. Not the Uberification not, of mining or not Amazon. Not quite there yet. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. I mean, unfortunately, I mean, this mining is still very much, you know, it's, it's a boots on the ground business, right? There are ways to improve efficiencies and that sort of thing, but you've, there's no way around, like, walking the rocks and getting to know what you're looking at and putting together a geological picture. Without that, you're, uh, you're kind of just chasing blind targets. And Ira, do you think, uh, as a geologist, that the next, you know, discoveries that will move the needle, will they be found you know, in far off, far flung places, or will they be in old mining camps, or will they be in, in you know, Yukon, for example? Yeah, I, I think it's gonna be a, a kind of a combination, um, quite frankly, and I, I agree with Mark. I mean, we haven't seen, uh, you know, new technology that's really been transformational, but we have seen a lot of efficiencies. Uh, Sean Ryan, who's at the conference today, would be an example in the Yukon, is who's really tried to deploy uh, kind of revised techniques to be more efficient and and cover larger areas and you know smaller portable rigs, different techniques for sampling. You know we every few years see new new advances in geophysics, which are which are all helpful, and they're helpful in being able to explore remote regions that we obviously have a lot of in 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 Canada. So I, I think we'll we'll see some of that. Brownfields exploration, I think, will necessarily continue because, quite frankly, we don't have enough money going into the ground by junior explorers now to, to really lead the way with uh, new discoveries and developments. So, uh, you know, we need to see a recharge in that part of the, that segment of the business to, I think, reinvigorate you know, discoveries happening at that level. So I think companies that are in production are going to continue to invest in brownfields exploration as a way to add to their resources and, and reserves. And, and, you know, back to uh, Doug's point about growth. I mean, I think, you know, we have moved on for growth for growth's sake. So I think companies are looking to ensure that whatever they do acquire is going to be accretive. And, uh, and that's also set a higher bar when it comes to new assets coming uh, into production. Right. And, you, you, you know, as this is an investors conference, and um, obviously you, you've all been very generous with your time, as we're closing it out, 
Um, you, you know, so much of the narrative is often focused on projects, but my whole business is predicated on people, and if you follow the good teams, they know what they're doing, they'll ultimately win. Um, I'd like to give all of you an opportunity to maybe let uh, the investors out here figure out, you know, how do they back you? How do they invest in what you're doing go along for the ride? So maybe start with Doug and go down. Well, I think the number one investment strategy that I've always uh, employed uh, myself personally and uh, always when someone asks me whether it's an institutional retail investor is uh, invest with people. Uh, assets come and go. Good people will find the right asset if the first one doesn't work. So in terms of investment philosophy, uh, stick with good people that you can talk to that don't avoid you. They're a CEO or on the board. Make sure you can talk to them and get the information you require. Um, it's a tough business. It's not easy creating value for shareholders in any sector, let alone the mining sector, because it's so cyclical. Um, uh, I think we're in, in, in tune now for a, a pretty exciting time uh, for investors. Um, you know, and, and don't, uh, and we're talking about M&A here, but uh, my motto is, uh, you know, we're not for sale, but everyone has their price. <laughs> so, yeah, ultimately, don't play something necessarily as a takeout, uh, play, a, play a stock because you know that the, the, uh, the asset is sound, it can be um, enriched, uh, management is good, we'll stick to it. And ultimately, if you do that, I think uh, investors will do very well. Whatever uh, commodity you're investing in, gold, copper, zinc, or whatever it is. And, and you're still active. You, you have Calibre, right? That's one of your... You have uh, Calibre mining? Absolutely. It's one we're focused on in Nicaragua. Um, it's uh, development stage, got resources. Uh, earlier stage, though, two big partners, um, two uh, mid-tier partners in IM Gold um, and Centera, and then we have 100% on ground as well. So we quite like uh, Nicaragua, great, great place to do business. We've been there for seven years. It's a great place to be. Outside of uh, Caliber, I would invest in anything that Ira and Mark are doing. <laughs> And, and yeah, Mark, how do, uh, you, you know, what's the best way for, for someone to sort of back you in what you're doing right now? I know you've got something new on the go. I get to do shameless promotion right now? Of course. Okay. I am. <laughs> hey, thank you. So the two deals that are alive and well in our oxygen stable of companies are Pure Gold and Liberty Gold, which has recently changed its name from Pilot Gold. So Pure Gold is, um, it's focused in Red Lake on the Madsen Mine in Ontario. And uh, we're drilling off brand new zones of, of a legacy mine, much like Integra just did, actually. It's a great analog. So we're finding new zones of 10 to 20 gram material. And we've hit five new zones. And by the end of the year, we should have a new resource out. It's a permitted mine site with a mill tailings facility with power. And uh, you can kind of do your own valuation analysis on it, but it's, it's a good buy. Uh, Liberty Gold is, uh, has just gone through a rebranding and it's focusing exclusively on its Great Basin projects in the southwest U.S. So in Nevada, Idaho, and Utah, we've got three past producing open pit Carlin deposits. And Gold Strike is our flagship project that we're drilling off aggressively right now. I would just say that over the last five years, this is a bit of a factoid, over the last five years there have been eight new open pit heap leach mines built in the world. Two of them have come from our group. Um, both reached commercial production last year, so Karma reached commercial production in Burkina Faso, which we built in uh, October, and Long Canyon reached commercial production in November, which Newmont built. We think Gold Strike is our third. Hmm. For you and Ira, you close it down. Okay, well, I'll, I'll be quicker, because really you have to stay tuned for my next deal, because it's still in the works, but um, I will may, maybe make a pitch for the for the Yukon generally. Um, there's lots of exciting uh, work going on in Yukon, so it's some it's a it's certainly a jurisdiction to keep your eye on. And then maybe outside of gold, I will make um, you know two lesser known um, maybe promotes, and that would be for two companies that I'm involved in advising. One is in the diamond space, and that's a little company called North Arrow, which is exploring one of the largest kimberlites in Canada, located in a very good uh, jurisdiction, very close to Tidewater in Nunavut, and it has a population of very rare, high-quality orange diamonds, and that's a very good value stock, so that's North Arrow. And uh, the other project that I'm certainly intrigued by is, is one... Uh, called Strongbow, and they are looking to put the South Crofty tin mine back into production in Cornwall. 
And uh, for those of you that uh, have an interest in, in looking outside of the gold space, I think those would be two very good uh, projects to have a look at it. From diamonds to tin, oh my goodness. Okay, well, you listen, we're out of time. Um, I want to thank all of you for taking, uh, you know, th this is a panel that you'll never see locally at one of these events, and I'm so thankful that you came up here. But, um, yeah, we're, the conference is officially done. Thank you all for coming, and may the next bull run come as quick as the last one disappeared. Good day. Thank you.